Hi guys, welcome back to my channel, Wisely Chosen, where I focus on elevation and enjoyment. My name is Diana and I'm so happy to have you. Today we have a nursing focused video and that's under the category of elevation because if you're watching this, you probably are wondering what is it like to be a nurse or you're trying to become a nurse or you're trying to switch into the field of rehab nursing. I am a rehab nurse. I have been now for, let me count, nine months and at my big age I still count on my fingers I have been a rehab nurse now for nine months and I've absolutely enjoyed it I really love the outcomes in this field you get to see progress in patients I would say more frequently than other fields this is just my assumption because this is the only type of nursing that I have practiced and I would really like to share a day in my life with you guys more in depth and you know I'm gonna have times for you guys to see what I do once I get to work as to what happens during the day as a nurse obviously I'm gonna be talking and telling you guys I cannot take my camera to work for numerous reasons and the biggest one being patient um, confidentiality and also how can I do my job with a camera in my hand I cannot <laughs> okay I can absolutely not so I would just be talking through with you guys what happens in the day um, as a nurse but I will include clips of me getting ready in the mornings and my routine and what that looks like and then also my routine coming back from work and at my job the time to clock in is 6 30 so once I get there I go to the locker room decompress get my jacket off it's winter you know how that goes or get my little pouch with my pens and my markers and stuff and, f and maybe on the markers because I tend to lose markers a lot and then I go to the center station once I go to the center station I pick up a phone for the day. I check out my schedule. See, not the, I check out the schedule and see which patient assignment that I have. If you're working a few days in a row, they try their best to keep you with the same group of people that you took care of before, just because it's more efficient and you are acclimated to the people. So usually you have the same people. And if you had an off day, like one or two off days, sometimes you have your fingers crossed, like. Oh my gosh, I hope I get these people again. And then sometimes you're like, you know what? I'm okay with a break from these people. So it's a lot of versatility in terms of who you're taking care of. So around that time, it's about 6.40. That's when I go to the station closest to the people I've been assigned. And I find the nurse that... The nurse who had them before for the night shift and we do report and during report we discuss uh, a couple of things and I will share those things with you got a blank report sheet here if you can see that I don't think it's being visible I think it's a pretty standard report sheet oh I'm sorry I just noticed the light readjust itself okay camera cuz I was gonna say um this is a pretty standard report sheet, I think, across the board that a lot of hospitals do use this kind of report sheet. Um, but I'll go through it with you guys as well. The first thing is the name of the patient. We usually cook the name of the patient, their age, um, the physician who is um, taking care of them during their stay. Also, if they're a full code or DNR, um, do not resuscitate or a full code in, term, in case of an emergency. There's the diagnosis that they're here for, their history, how alert and oriented are they, what are their allergies, any precautions that are on, and that's like fall precautions, seizure precaution, diabetic precaution, aspiration precautions, just to name a few. The kind of isolation that they're on, standard isolation, contact, GI isolation, drop droplets isolation that's also there as well they have their diet and the diet can range from NPO meaning they can't um, have any food orally and they're supplemented with feeds and we also include the type of feed that they get when they get it and the flushes that they get along with them and those patients usually have G tubes which is also important because that's also going to be the way that they get their medication that was a lot I hope you're following with me this is going to be a long video but I'm trying to give you guys a detailed um, understanding of what it is like in the day of a nurse especially if you're in nursing school and you are curious as to what your day is going to be like or if you want to switch fields and you're curious I want to make sure I give you guys all the information so sit down grab some tea 
tea, grab some coffee, whatever is your thing, grab some wine, and get ready to hear a good amount of information from me. I am going to be breaking this down. I'm breaking this down. So the first diet was MPO. Some people are in a minced and moist diet, which is a modified consistency in regards to their ability to swallow. Um, soft and bite size as well as also a modified consistency and a regular diet that's also the kind of diet that they have and along with these consistencies it's really important to know how what kind of liquids they can intake so some people again if they're MPO none at all some people are on thickened liquids they can be moderately thick or mildly thick there is a difference and that took me a while but I learned that lesson as a patient care technician and not as a nurse thank God but that is something that I really was confused by all the time but one is level two and the other one is level four I believe and I honestly need to know the numbers because if I think mild and moderate I can't I can't comprehend like it's mild moderate like I don't know who determines that but let's not do a little mild moderate rant right now okay and the last kind of liquid they can have is thin liquids which is just regular water regular consistency of liquids uh, right so I think I've gotten through that portion for diet. Then we have meds, how they can take their medications. Patients can take their medications whole, which is the regular form that most people are familiar with. They can take them crushed, which is we have this little um, thing, don't, a crusher, a pill crusher. Yeah, because I, I got confused with the pill splitter. No, a pill crusher. And you put the medication inside and you crush it. And that, you know, makes smooth, smoothens the medication into a dust consistency. And you can give that to patients with applesauce or yogurt. Yes, I'm doing good telling you guys these things. I'm, I'm on track, okay? So yeah, we have that crushed with sauce or yogurt. And then also you can crush the medications if the patients take their medication. You have the G-tube and you put that medication, the crushed medication, in thin liquids. You put that in water, you mix it in, and then you draw it up with a syringe. And then you put it through the G-tube. And then after that, you take a syringe and fill it with regular water and you flush it. That keeps the G-tube patent and doesn't have it clogged because trust me, if you clog the G-tube, you're literally deterring yourself from other things that you could do just more time, throws your, throws your, throws you behind and hopefully, fingers crossed, the orders for unclogging the G-tube are in. Otherwise, you're waiting for a lot of things. So do not, do not clog your G-tube. Okay, next line is if the patient is a blood sugar or not, and that is if they're a diabetic patient or if they're receiving a steroid medication, which can also increase your blood sugar. That is on there. Most patients, are their blood sugars are taken either BID, which is twice a day, or QID, which is um, four times a day. Yeah. Alrighty. Since this is a rehab facility, it is really important for us to know the transfer of patients. I'm going to go through the different transfers for you now. The first transfer is stand step and that's exactly as it sounds. The patient is able to stand and step. Okay. That means they're able to walk on their own. Most people who are stand step are contact guard. Port them via a gate belt which you put around them and you hold them up that way and you walk with them. They're able to walk but they need more support or supervision touch which is just being there and watching them walk and just being there for supervision and touching just in case if they wobble a little bit. Uh, the next one I would say would be a squat pivot or a stand pivot so which means they can stand and pivot into a wheelchair or squat and pivot into a witch wheelchair. There's also sliding board patients who can use a slide board to kind of take themselves from I wish I had these things to show you guys but I'm sorry I don't. Um, they can, you put the slide board which is kind of like a a, a wooden slat or like is that the word you know a wood <laughs> a piece of wood it's smooth and everything I'm gonna say that if slat isn't the slate isn't the right word I'm not sorry it's really showing that English is not my first language right now um and you put that on the bed and then in, in between the bed and the chair as a um as a, a connecting piece kind of and you have the patient sit on there and they kind of scoop themselves into the chair and it's smooth so it kind of helps them go that way okay um 
I think I got that. And then some patients, to go back to stand step, they can be stand step with a walker or a cane as well. Um, so we have the slide board, and I don't think I'm missing anything. Um, there are slide board, lateral scoot are the same thing. Our uh, pop over is also a uh, similar category where they just pop over from their bed into the wheelchair. And the last one is a lift, which is for patients who aren't able to get up on their own, scoot or squat pivot, any of those. We use a lift for them, a overhead lift. And that lift, you basically put a sling under the patient and there are four hooks. So two up here and two at the bottom underneath um, their thighs and you hook that up to the lift and you there's a remote for the lift and you press up and they go up and you press down and they go down and you and it moves from the ceiling onto where the chair is and the patient sits in the wheelchair I am realizing this video is gonna be really long but uh, okay alrighty and we're just going through report guys like I'm just telling you guys what report entails maybe I will do this in parts I think I'm gonna do this video in parts so I'm gonna do this report and then I'm gonna do part two which is an actual day for me I think that's what I'm gonna do okay I'm gonna do that for you guys because yeah um alrighty so that's the transfer and the devices that you use like I said walker cane lift all that information is there and then safety is where we put the restraints that the patient has, if the patient has restraints. And these restraints are either for impulsivity, um, they are impulsive or they aren't aware of what's going on and that's impairing their medical care. Those are the main reasons for people to get restraints. And a few restraints are mittens, which they get mittens either in one hand or bilateral hands. Um, yeah, so that could be for patients who might be pulling at a G tube, pulling at their trach, um, just um, doing things impulsively or ways that could impair their care. We have wraparounds, which are when the patient is seated in a wheelchair, we put a wraparound around them. This is for patients who might be impulsive to try to get up on their own and walk on their own and they don't have the full capability to do so, so that might lead to a fall. We don't want to fall. We do not want to fall. That is something that you do not want. Um, that's for those. And we also have a talking seat belt. We also have talking seat belts, which, which aren't considered a restraint because the patient is able to click and undo it. However, it does go off and warn the patient. It goes like, please sit down or please do not walk. Please wait for your next. We can hear it going on off. And it's so funny because I know the sound in my sleep, but like in order to make it for you guys, I can't right now. So just know it's like a beep, 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 beep noise and you can hear it. Um, and then we also have bed exit and that's on the bed. If they're on the bed and they try to get up, that also goes off. And that goes actually directly to our phone systems that I picked up earlier. And that goes off and we can see the bed exit. It says bed exit is going off and it says what room number. And usually the light on their room, outside of their room, flashes. And we are able to run to the room by seeing the light or seeing our phone to see which room that is. Okay. And then we also have side rails times four. Side rails times four is considered a restraint, and I learned that in nursing school. I knew like four side rails is a restraint, okay? Three isn't, four is because they aren't able to get out of their bed unless someone is there to help them. And so don't put four side rails on a patient who isn't, who there isn't an order for that because that is considered a restraint. Let's move into continence. We have bladder and bowel continence. So it's either they're continent, it's either they're incontinent, or they're 50-50. And patients can be a multitude of continent with bladder, but not with bowel, or vice versa. It just depends on their diagnoses and their ability to sense the urge to go. Okay, so in terms of bladder and their continence, there's also this thing that we have called BVI, which is the bladder volume index, which is helped to see how much a patient is retaining urine or not retaining urine, which is I like to see them not retaining urine. So usually with the BVI, we do this about um, Q4 or Q6, which is every four hours or every six hours. And we have this bladder 
um, BVI machine and we take that and there's an instrument at the end. We put this gel similar to I think it's probably the same thing as what they use for ultrasounds on their um, lower abdomen in between their abdomen and their groin area where the bladder would be and we put the inst we put the gel and then we put the instrument on there obviously this is all like clean down I'm just telling you how to do it but yes you need to clean this whole machine because we use it on multiple patients sanitary reasons like con like contact um precaution reasons you just don't want to be using some grabbing something just using it you need to clean it and clean it after each use as well too so yeah, so you put that on there and you um, move it around and there's a screen on the machine and you can see where their bladder is and it kind of like um, draws it out as in a circle and you can see, you, you know, you can see it. I don't know how to describe it. I'll try to find pictures to include in this video so you guys can visualize it if you're a visual learner. And then after that, you just click the uh, capture button and it tells you how much you're in there retaining. So if they have BVI orders, the doctor... So orders usually read BVIQ4 calf greater than 400 or calf greater than 500. And that's if they aren't able to say urinate on their own and they're retaining urine, then we will have to calf them because we do not want that urine sitting in their bladder because that's just a recipe for an infection, okay? A recipe for a UTI. So we calf those. And some patients are able to void on their own sometimes and then sometimes are retaining. So the goal with this is to get them either on a consistent calfing schedule if they're unable to urinate on their own or have them be able to urinate on their own. Yes, okay, I think I said that well. All right, the next part is respiratory. Respiratory is, are they on room air, which means are they able to breathe on their own, or do they get oxygen oxygenation with the nasal cannula? At what percentage, at what rate? So like, you know, um, is it two liters of nasal cannula? And if, if the, that two, if they're getting two liters of na nasal cannula, some people are just getting two liters of nasal cannula and that's it. Or some people have parameters where it's like they get two liters to keep them above 90% and and if they are above 90% then they don't need the two liters anymore, stuff like that. Also included in respiratory is if the patient is a trach patient. Um, I hope you guys are familiar with the trach patient, but basically they have a trach inserted right here on their throat and the trachs come in different sizes and numbers and brands, so we say those in report as well. Um, as well as if they're capped during the day, if they get an HME during the day, which is humidified air um, going through there to help them with their oxygenation. Um, is there anything else? HME, um, capped or bleeding. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. This is in regards to the unit that I work on. I know that um, in other units they might discuss ventilation if they have their patients on ventilators as well. I am not familiar with that, so therefore I will not discuss that in terms of how report goes down for what I am familiar with. Okay. Um, the next portion is skin. What is their skin like? Is their skin intact or not intact? That means do they have any wounds anywhere like a um, surgical incision is a type or pressure injury or more commonly known as a bed sore is a type. Skin tears, abrasions, pressure injuries go from stage 1, stage 2, stage 3 or unstageable. If you're in nursing school, you know this information or if you're a nurse, you know this information. If you're just a regular people who likes uh, to watch videos for fun, if you don't need to know what this is, then save yourself. <laughs> So basically for the skin, if it's not intact and they have like a pressure injury, there's dressings that need to be done for those pressure injuries. So in this portion of report, we do give the um, dressing orders that are in the system for how we should give them dressings, that's it, gauze, or what kind of, you know, if they're getting meta honey or santal, different things of that nature to help the wound heal, um, what we're doing, basically what we're doing to take care of that wound. Or some wounds are on their way to healing and they're left open to air because there's nothing else that we can do to aid in that healing process. So that as well. Um, let's see. The next part is IV lines, tubes, and devices. Okay, so for IVs, that is basically we say, where do they have an IV placed? Is it in a cubicle? Is it in the forearm? Is it in the hand? 
what gauge that IFE is. Is it 20? Is it 22? Those are the usual ones. Um, as you guys know, the lower the number, the bigger it is. And that's another thing I had to constantly drill in my head during nursing school. For the purpose of this, I'm going to just say it's one channel and say they're getting like an IV antibiotic through it or IV fluids. Um, that's what we say during this portion of report. What, what are they getting in the IV? What is the indication for the IV? And if, if the IV is there and it's not being used, we want to take that away immediately because for quoi? We just don't have things for no reason. So yeah. Um, and devices too, because this is a rehab um, facility, a lot of them have like um, AFOs and PREFOs, which is the ankle foot arthritis. Ankle foot orthosis, okay, and I'm not gonna try to pronounce the other ones, just know they have orthotics that they use. Um, and so that's what we put in device. Some of them get Z Flex boots at night. Um, that's to help relieve pressure from their from their heels back to skin. They can get pressure injuries on their heels or their bottom. So we try to do things that prevent these from occurring or more susceptible to pressure injuries so we have those on devices some people have hand splints um, as well I'm trying to think of other devices so that they could have but just or heart monitors um, yeah that's also included in devices and just anything else that we need to know that they have um, we put that in report at this portion cool next Patches, this is if they're getting nicotine patches or like lidocaine patches. Um, we put that in report and it's very important to say when they were put because these things are changed either daily or 12, every 12 hours or every 72 hours. So it's really important to know when that is um, done. Next we have pain. Um, if a patient is pain and what location are they in pain and what they are getting for pain in terms of medication or heating devices which is also included in the lines of devices. I'm thinking of things uh, like a K-pad and stuff like that um, to help with their pain that's included in devices but in this pain we have pain management in terms of medication and the location of the pain and we also have if the patient's pain medications aren't scheduled and their PRN which is as needed then we have to state what time they were last given so we know if it's Q4, Q6 to um, not give them too early or too late especially if it's a narcotic well any medication in general but in terms of a narcotic you do not want to do that and I'm really glad that they implemented this new system in our charting where it notifies you if you're too early giving a PRN medication say that you missed it in a report or confused the time when you were writing it down the computer automatically catches that which it didn't before but or you can always double check the time that it was last administered in the MAR which I will get to that too. This is gonna be a good amount of part video. I'm already seeing it, okay. PRN, so the medications that they're getting is needed. Um, this can include pain medication, this could include bowel management medications to kind of help them go. Um, if they haven't gone in a while, I missed that. So for bowel, we also include last BM, and this is really important because once they get to the three or four day mark of having not had a bowel movement, it's time to step in. <laughs> it's time to step in, offer them Miralax, offer them look at Magnesia, other things that aren't medicine, it could be prune juice. Um, a medical thing we could also do is give them a suppository but of course all of these are within orders of a doctor um, but of course the nurses we have the ability to ask the doctor to put in an order or recommend that hey this person hasn't gone can we do something about that and see what we get and those are the options cool um, Tylenol I know I dropped some like just oral lubricant refresher drops are also in PRNs there's so many different multitude of um, medication that could be included in PRNs, just things that they need as needed and it's not necessarily scheduled for them to take. We're doing good. And lastly, the last portion of report is notes. It's basically things that, you know, aren't really covered, which is crazy because we went through a lot of stuff, but it's like, oh my God, what else could not be covered in report? Trust me a lot. Um, an example could be if they have a fam family member at the bedside, 
um, if they have like an appointment the next day that's really important if they have the heart monitor like a Zio patch or a Biotel that needs to be returned on a certain date that's included there um, if they're also like a say a dialysis patient this is where I usually put like the day that they get dialysis and what, what time any labs um, that are abnormal or I really want to pass down to the next shift I put the I put it here as well basically any miscellaneous information that isn't covered in report and is really important to relate to the next shift it's written in notes yeah okay so guys <laughs> that concludes part one of day in the life of a nurse and that was just like the morning that basically is the time from 6 30 wow I can't believe this whole video um, took time the time between let me think so I want to say like 6.40 to 7 o'clock is when we give report and this is what is everything that I went through with you guys is what we go through for every patient that we have which is usually an assignment of five to six patients so this took a while to break down everything because of course this is the first time but when you do this um, almost every day and on every shift you get the hang of it and this is why it also comes in very handy to have the people that you had before because you already have the history and diagnoses and you can just get updates about their diet their transfer when their last bowel movement was their PRN medication and other stuff it's just gonna be mainly updates so that's why it's really nice to have the same people that you had before for efficiency in regards to time but I'm gonna conclude this video here. Please look out for the part two. I will be recording that. I'll include more in depth at what goes on during my day. But for now, this is gonna be the day in the life of the nurse report. But yes, thank you guys so much for joining in for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you have any questions about report, what else, like if I missed something or if you have a question, if you're wondering how about this, missed it I couldn't think of it right now please comment down below I will be answering your questions but thank you guys so much for tuning in make sure you like comment subscribe and share and I will be coming to you guys with a part two thank you guys for joining be blessed always and I'll catch you in the next video bye